Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Congo, Colonization and Conservation, a sub-series of Guerrilla Radio Show. The following episode will cover the formation of Africa's first national park. Dedicated in 1925 is Albert National Park, now known by its more famous name, Virunga. As you may have picked up on, the Congolese national park system was first established by the Belgian colonial administration. While there will be multiple opinions presented in this episode, the following is not an argument against the national park system, but rather an exploration of multiple African scholars' views on the national park system, as well as their suggested alternatives. As always, we're receptive to listener feedback, and if you think we've gotten something wrong and would like us to provide sources or fact-check us, please feel free to DM us on any of our Guerrilla Radio social media accounts, and we'd love to answer any questions or address any concerns you may have. Today's episode is entitled Virunga. I'm one of your hosts, Greg, and I'm going to let my co-host introduce themselves in turn. Hey, I'm Austin. Hi, I'm Chandran, and today we are joined by a very special guest from Big Soy Naturals. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Virgil. I'm the co-host of Big Soy Naturals. You may also know me as the inventor of moral relativism and a professional iconoclast. Okay. So with that, let's get into part one of this episode, German East Africa, the confluence of anthropology's origin and colonial state building. In October 1902, German captain Robert von Behring shot two large apes during an expedition to establish the boundaries of German East Africa. One of the apes shot by von Behring was recovered and sent to the Berlin Zoological Museum, where Professor Paul Match classified the animal as a new species of gorilla, naming it Gorilla Beringe, or as we know it, the Eastern Gorilla, after, of course, the man who first brought the specimen back to Europe. The German East Africa Company was one of the first expressions of German imperialism following the massive explosion of economic growth in Germany following unification and industrialization in the 1850s through 1870s. Exploiting the non-industrialized portions of the world for economic growth would be incredibly profitable. However, without the long-standing state machinery of a world-spanning empire such as the English or Dutch, or the brute force and lack of oversight of the Belgians, the German East Africa Company quickly came to the conclusion that it was not possible to effect run a colonial empire without leveraging the violence of the state to suppress opposition and mass. A side note, this was a mistake the German Empire would not make twice when it came to pacifying one of their other main African colonies, Namibia, where they conducted the Herero and Namaqua genocide from 1904 to 1908. So, after relinquishing administrative control of German East Africa to the government in 1891, the colony comprised the areas of modern-day Tanzania, Burundi, and Rwanda. Of the many exploratory and extractive industries built here, the central industries were deforestation, mining, the establishment of plantations, and mass resource extraction. However, another profitable and century-defining industry grew from the German occupation of Africa, the burgeoning field of wildlife research. As you probably already know, Germany lost World War I and had to hand over their colonial empire to the British, French, and Belgians. In 1919, German East Africa, which at this point included but was not limited to portions of the Congo, was dissolved by a League of Nations mandate and awarded to Britain. Belgium, who already occupied much of the Congo, was not keen on sharing the spoils of conquest. Belgium negotiated the Anglo-Belgian Agreement of May 30, 1919, where Britain ceded the northwestern GEA districts of Rwanda and Burundi to Belgium. Fast forward to the 1920s. Belgium had consolidated control of the Congo, and thanks to the ventures of the German East Africa Company, many of the mysterious and fascinating great apes of Africa were now catalogued and named by Western science. So, this brings us to the father of taxidermy and one of the first primatologists proper, Carl Akeli. Previous listeners of Gorilla Radio Show may remember this name, and if you'd like a proper look into Akeli and his work until we dive deeper into him in a later episode, I strongly recommend the chapter Teddy Bear Patriarchy from Donna Haraway's book Primate Visions. I believe we talked about this on the episode we did with uh, CT. It was uh, the Neuralink episode, Can Die 1001 Deaths. Yeah. So, you know, I support your recommendation, but also... Are you familiar with that image where it's like, what what the fuck is this? And it looks like a little like gerbil with uh, like maybe some earrings or something. And it's like, but what's going on in here? Like, is it a gerbil? And it's not really. It's just like, what is this? I'm, I'm not familiar. Well, 
looking at that is how it feels to read Donna Haraway sometimes. It is understandable. What is what is this? One, I <laughs> I completely words? understand that. If like you got to figure out what it. she's talking about sometimes, but you could draw decent conclusions from it. And yeah, they're, they're words that draw the shape of vibes, and then from the vibes you can like sometimes discern meaning <laughs> but it's like it's you know it, it takes it takes yeah. some work um and i guess that's the only caveat that i would give if anyone's trying to read some donna haraway it's good at, as a primatological reference because nobody looks at primatological history in this way for better or worse haraway is very interesting i like haraway that's why my pin tweet is still cthulhu scene is a very simple word from i think staying with the trouble um which is not a true statement at all, but her words have great vibes. Yeah. So what's important though is that his method, Carla Kelly, is it not of studying Akeley? nature. What's important is that Carl Akeley's. Sorry, I said that wrong earlier. It's Akeley. Carl Akeley's method of studying nature, as was the case with most Western scientists as the time was to shoot as many primates as possible in an attempt to learn how to properly taxidermy one so that it could be studied in the West up close and in detail. In 1925, Carl Akeley convinced Albert I of Belgium to establish the Albert National Park to protect the wildlife of the Virunga Mountains. This change came about after Akeley had spent some time in Africa collecting specimens for the Smithsonian, uh, he had a fundamental change of heart in how primatology should be conducted during this time, though, spending much of the rest of his life working for the preservation of the mountain gorilla population, uh, rather than just blindly shooting as many as he possibly could. However, regardless of his wishes, uh, it, was, it was still the primary method of primatological knowledge to just taxidermy apes and bring them back to America. Well, this was this was like back before people had to have jobs. And, exactly. Uh, Your job you could know, just be bohemian man. Well, and like we think that landlords like don't do a lot of work now, but like they really used to not do a lot of work, and then they had to find other things to do to like fill their time, and that's how we got archaeology. That's how we got pro probably primatology too. Like a, a lot of uh, yeah, I don't know, Western fields of study were started by a couple of guys that had too much time on their hand because they never had to like do anything inside their house or outside their house ever. Um, going back to what we were talking about, um, when the uh, Albert National Park was established in April of 1925 as the Congo's first national park, it was conceived um, of as a preserve for Africa's natural wildlife. Naturally, ripe for exploration and exploitation by European scientists who hope to journey into the natural, undisturbed, and primitive ecosystem and then leave with verifiable proof of their theories. The local wildlife was hunted or captured on a massive, methodical scale in the name of studying the supposedly undisturbed ecosystem. This became especially problematic when considering the racist and xenophobic definition of wildlife by, uh, used by Western scientists at the time. Among the many animals captured, the pygmy tribes of the Eastern Congo were also subject to brutal capture and study at the hands of European and American explorers, with many ending up in human zoos across the Western world. Very cool and let's let's also just i'm just going to point this out for everybody um a lot of these theories that these western quote scientists um had were just the most absolute crackpot bullshit you can ever think of um aquatic ape theory this time period all right bullshit absolutely insane yeah. things these people are going out into the jungle looking for like proof of the nephilim okay <laughs> so remember that when they're shooting I don't know, 50% of the remaining mountain gorillas, they're looking for proof of giants. They're still looking for the fucking holy grail. They're still going out all over the world looking there. for... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, some of the next stuff I'm going to read here is going to be paraphrased from an article called Primitives and Protected Areas. International Conservation and the Naturalization of Indigenous People 
um, by a German professor, Rolf de Bont of uh, Maastricht University. So um, here I go. The man most often credited with pioneering international nature conservation is the Swiss zoologist, ethnographer, and so-called gentleman scientist, Paul Saracen. Central to Saracen's vision of global conservation was the ecological concept of life community or biocoenosis, a notion that referred to the whole of interacting organisms in a certain habitat. Protecting these communities would involve the protection of both plants and animals. However, Saracen also believed that the duties of global nature protection went further. In the opening speech at the foundational conference of the Consultative Commission for International Nature Protection, or the CCINP, in 1913, he explained that, quote, its most important and worthiest mission concerned the protection of the noblest of all living natural creatures. The creatures he was referring to were the so-called nature volker, literally translating to nature people. Okay. I'm not going to say this like, you know, a crowd, so. The term nature walker is Saracen's term for the indigenous peoples of the world, who he viewed as less than the civilized culture walker, meaning cultural peoples of the West. Yeah. For Saracen, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For Saracen, like, mm -hmm. when, you know, when they start using the V to be the, <laughs> like, it's like, you know, that like nothing good is going to come out of that. If the German word for people is used ever in anything you ever read other right. than marks, all right? It's, it's always very scary. <laughs> Not good. Yeah, it's it's never the start of anything great. Culture Volker, get out of here. It gets worse when you start using the V for the U. That's when <laughs> that's when you're in real deep shit. <laughs> so for Saracen, there was a um like confluence of the idea of the extinction and the westernization of primitive people, quote unquote. Um, this had to be stopped for the same reason that animal species had to be preserved these communities were scientifically interesting. The so-called nature walker were believed to be remnants of a prehistoric natural past, especially when found in their untouched purity. Studying these tribes, such as the Mbuti, would thus allow Western researchers to understand their own evolutionary origins. Yet unlike the European branch of the evolutionary tree, modern primitives were believed to be unable to reach more advanced stages of civilization. Contacts with the modern world will not only introduce the vices of surrounding pseudo-savages and accelerate their extinction, meaning that by contacting these so-called untouched peoples, their primitive purity would be destroyed and their pseudo-scientific novelty would cease to exist. I would like to take a quick pause here, and I would like everybody at home to remember where we are, okay? We are in Germany and Switzerland, and it is... 1905 to 1925. I want you to think about what's happening. being written down. I want you to see what's being written down in this in the world of enlightened science in the West. Oh. And then I want you to apply that to the political rhetoric of the succeeding decade. Okay? Mm. The, these things are directly tied in. If the scientific world is telling uh, a failed painter in Austria that people that don't look like him are less that this is what happens. I'm um, so, and I think this is something that everybody should keep in mind that science is politics. Um, the two do not exist independently of each other. And when you see people peddling pseudoscience that exists for really only, let's say, racialized reasons or for reasons of othering certain groups of people, you that is reflected in the politics of the world around. Well, and science being political, I feel like is like the the idea of evolution obviously has some merit to it. But then when you like think about what other beliefs were just cir circulating in the air in Europe um, at the time that like evolution, what like the theory of evolution was first introduced to people, of course naturally what's going to follow is the idea that like some peoples are more evolved than other people um and that doesn't mean that the idea of evolution like is is incorrect but this is like it's a natural conclusion of how that idea yeah, is going right. to get implemented when europe is like being fucking racist mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately that does come up quite a bit uh later on 
in the episode. So, you know. I mean, Stay one tuned. thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that also kind of bring back, you know, Haraway and writers like her. Um, this this idea, the culture walker, the nature walker, is built on a, like, dichotomy with almost, like, a hard line in the middle. Which is fundamental. Like, the, these people or these thinkers were believing that there was, like, some kind of critical mass of, like, culture that these people could be introduced to until they're just not that anymore that kind of framing of traditional and progressive or that rather is that is the framing that the european western world needs to consider itself or to paint itself as progressive these aren't real yeah. distinctions they are well, purely political and there is also like a like a binary that's being created between like nature and civilizations are created by people um mm -hmm. that is really common in i don't know like west western anthropologists uh, and pe people of that type where um yeah like the way that people live imagine scare quotes like within nature is is seen as more i guess like the, the default way of being and then any like structures or systems or tools that are created by people is um like urban or is civilized and it's it's just a little bit like it's a it's a silly distinction that doesn't make a lot of sense when you know that animals also create tools animals also create like dwellings for themselves um but that is totally how you end up in a place where actual people are put into zoos so that you can be you can observe how they behave within nature because you see them as like distinctly different from your own kind of human um because they are not like creating tools and using them and living in the same way that you are which you consider civilized even though like it is something that that all animals do impose their will on nature and create things for themselves to make it easier yeah. The First World War, in its aftermath, led to a collapse of Saracen's CCINP organization before it could accomplish its stated goals, and Saracen himself quickly lost a lot of prominence in interwar anthropological debates. This did not prevent his ideas from exercising continued influence in the following decades, however, as you might have guessed. Saracen's conceptions were picked up in a small transnational network of conservationists who, in 1927, managed to set up the International Office of Documentation and Correlation for Nature Protection, referred to here as the IONP, in Brussels. This office was mainly a clearinghouse for environmental information, but also acted as a lobbying organization for nature protection. Both the staff and finances at the disposal of the office were limited, but the close ties of its leadership with aristocratic circles, the Belgian colonial administration, and the Belgian royal family itself made it incredibly influential. Two subsequent directors of the office, Jean-Marie Derscheid and Victor von Strylin, combined their function with the directorship of the newly founded Albert National Park in the east of the Belgian Congo. This put them in a powerful position and enabled them to put Saracen's dream of pseudoscience-oriented natural reserves into practice. By the mid-1920s, the ambitions of the conservationists at the IONP had grown substantially, in no small part to Saracen's long-lived and outsized influence on the anthropological field. It was no longer just gorillas, but primitive nature as a whole that should be protected. The pygmies, namely the Batwa and Mbuti peoples, became symbols of primitive Garden of Eden-esque nature. This is clear in the rhetoric of the American writer Mary Akeley, widow of Carl Akeley and an influential supporter of the park. In 1928, at a meeting of the British Society for the Preservation of the Fauna of the Empire, she stressed how Albert National Park offered an almost unique opportunity to save some of the primitive African pygmies, a race now threatened by extinction. See? This is what I'm fucking talking about! With, like, the- Yeah, like, the use of the term extinction. Yeah. Well, and also this, like, just illogical dichotomy created between, like, civilized people and people of nature. I think it's it's something that comes up a lot in the way that Americans will talk about indigenous people here, where, like, people will, like, express sadness or confusion that indigenous people are not, like, 
living in a way that they have like concocted in a very specific like fantasy in their minds where they should be like trapped in the 1500s or something um mm -hmm. like there was something that happened like two decades ago i think where the macaw tribe in washington wanted to um hunt a whale which they had treaty rights for and then various people who were protesting it were upset that they were planning on using like modern tools instead of like a harpoon or something as if um they should be stuck in the year 1500 because that is the european western conception of how indigenous people should be living there's this concept of something called the imperial shutter which is when the empire closes off their imagination um at a certain point in order to preserve that dichotomy, the traditional progressive dichotomy. And that is, that's where America has trapped indigenous peoples. They are captured in our imperial shutter and we, through our everyday expectations for them, and then our, of course, our overranging policies, our government uh, sanctioned policies over their lands and their freedoms, they are trapped in a kind of proto, you know, colonial, pre-colonial time. Uh, that's where they're expected to be. Well, and I, I think it's just, like, part of the, you know, obviously, like, incorrect and racist belief that does sort of, like, stem from this misinterpretation of, of evolution where only European people and, like, people of European descent have the right or the ability to move forward in time and to evolve and to, like, improve their systems and change the tools that they use. And then everything else has to be, like, preserved because of course you know you wouldn't expect i'm trying to think of an animal that is stupid what's a dumb animal a chihuahua, Our part, chihuahua. you wouldn't you wouldn't expect a chihuahua to run a city you know <laughs> you, you would never make a chihuahua a mayor that you tell chihuahuas what to do and it is like that sort of uh same like it's that paternal I mindset yeah yeah of like yeah not trusting non-european people to be able to make decisions and how to like govern themselves and how to run the land that they live on and so instead like lording your will over it and deciding that like preserving it in the time that you found it is the best way to to handle that regardless of the the wishes of the people that actually are from there and live there you know, I'm not sure if I know this for a fact. I'm pretty sure Charles Darwin was not like a hyper racist. Probably yeah, I, don't think, they, I don't think that Darwin. We'll, we'll get back to you yeah, on that yeah, in another episode. But, but um, no, the point I'm trying to make. I don't think is... Darwin needed to be a racist for these ideas to come out of the idea of evolution because oh, no, that's no, just no. what Europe was, you know? Yeah, it. That my the point I, I'm make, trying to make is like a scientist would come to the European community and be like, "Here's this new fact," and Europe would do anything in its fucking power to ensure that they could twist it in a way where they remained on top. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not that different from like eco fascism now, where of course we are we're facing some pretty pressing cl climate issues, um, and then the way that's some people want to handle that is by telling um, Africans to not have babies. Um, like, look up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation if you if you aren't aware. And that doesn't mean that the like the underlying idea of like we need to help save our planet and protect it from climate change like that is that is correct. But then the like way of going about it th through trying to tell people that they shouldn't have kids is like, that's obviously like stemming from a racist interpretation of uh -huh. that idea that I think is just like the science is political thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's similar. Liberals need to stop saying, I believe in science. Like, what do you mean? What, science? what kind Who's of science? science? Yeah. I think the, a I milder believe in the version of that, science. that <laughs> shout outs. Um, I think a milder version that you probably heard often lately is like when we're talking about CO2 production. We're like, oh yeah, we make CO2, but what about India and China? What about all these Asian countries that are, you know, the at, at the center of industry right now? And this is, once again, a, a desire to trap them. To trap them in their traditional states. So, back to our regularly scheduled programming, everyone. Um, so, um, 
The Belgian rhetoric at this time um, did not match realities on the ground. Uh, unlike what was suggested by the London Conference, the, the Pygmies were far from the only inhabitants of Albert National Park. Since its foundation, thousands of Hutus and Tutsis, who you may have heard about before, had been evicted from the park grounds, particularly after the park's far-reaching expansion in 1929 to include the Virunga Mountains proper and the plains south of Lake Edward. Only the Pygmies, however, were allowed to stay within the park's boundaries and maintain hunt, uh, maintained rights to hunt, fish, and harvest bamboo as they were considered to be a part of the natural harmony. The subtext of this is that they are they are considered the wildlife. We, um, the Belgian government at the time just considered the, the pygmy tribes as, as little more than what they would consider the gorillas. So these tribes were the object of a wildlife inventorying expedition organized by the park um, between 1933 and 36. The preceding report was published in a series that, that exclusively concerned animals and plants. Um, the London-based newspaper The Times praised the Belgians for treating the pig, quote, treating the pygmies quite properly as fauna rather than as tribes to be civilized, leaving them to, quote, their primeval existence. So this all to say, really, that the Mbuti and Batwa people were dehumanized and cataloged. The lasting impact of these practices linger. In 2003, Sinefasi Makello, a representative of Mbuti Pygmies, told the UN Indigenous Peoples Forum that during the 1997 to 1999 Congo Civil War, his people were hunted down and eaten as though they were game animals. So let's just also reinforce here that folks you should know who the Hutus and Tutsis are. I hopefully you've at least seen the movie. Can you, with Don can you tell Shield. people if they are not familiar? Okay, so the Hutu and the Tutsi are two ethnic groups, um, the native to the area around Rwanda, Burundi, and Virunga National Park. Um, historically, I believe it's the Tutsis are are lighter skinned as an ethnic group than the Hutus, who are darker skinned. So when Belgian colonial authorities moved in and took over, they used this race division to raise Tutsis up to a higher level in colonial administration and colonial government. This resulted in, I believe it's the early 1990s, in a genocide um, where after years of Tutsi domination over Rwandan, Burundan, and Let's just say the Virunga area um, dominance by Tutsis. Uh, the Hutu rose up and massacred hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of uh, ethnic Tutsis. Um, this led to multiple wars. It also contributed to the war in the Congo, which spilled over. Um, so yeah, that's who they are. Understand that these colonial attitudes towards the pygmies was translated directly into a lot of these post-colonial governments um, in Central Africa. These governments usually at first attempted to actually be liberatory and after having usually successive coups done by the French and Belgians were nothing more than puppets run by black faces. Um, so these attitudes, these colonial attitudes towards the pygmy tribes persisted and persist into the modern day. Um, this is why things like this happen, and this is why these people still don't necessarily have the same rights, freedom, or quite honestly, personhood in their home countries as everybody else. Yeah, so this brings us into a particularly bleak, horrific example. And so for this entire next section, I'm just going to do a big blanket trigger content warning for racism and suicide. But, uh, again, one particularly bleak example of this mistreatment, dehumanization, and torture of the indigenous peoples of the Congo is the story of Odabanga, a 21-year-old Mobuti tribe member. Odabanga lived an indigenous lifestyle in the equatorial forests near the Kasai River in what was then the Congo Free State. In 1904, his people were attacked by the Force Publique, a name we should all remember from episode one of this series. 
Benga's wife and two children were murdered by the Belgians. However, he survived as he was on a hunting expedition when his village was raided. He was subsequently captured by African slave traders and sold to Samuel Phillips Werner. Werner, um, a self-described African explorer, former missionary, and actual liar, had written to the director of the Bronx Zoo William Temple Hornaday on August 28th requesting a meeting to discuss the possibility of the zoo temporarily housing a chimpanzee and two reptiles that he had brought back from Africa. This supposed chimpanzee was Otabenga. In 1905, Hornaday created the American Bison Society and led the national campaign for the establishment of federally protected bison ranges with President Theodore Roosevelt. It was with these credentials and influential friends that Hornaday presided over the world's largest and most modern metropolitan zoo. The renowned zoologist could now claim credit for the zoological park's latest sensation, the exhibition of Benga, an African pygmy, in the monkey house. You know, it's like, I know, I know that they were doing this. I, I know that this was going on. But every time that I learn about the different types of people that were, like, kept on display by people who didn't even know about shitting in a toilet, you know? Like, people who kept giving themselves diseases because they couldn't figure out how to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, then, and then they think that they are, like, so evolved that they have the right to put other people on display and have people gawk at them. And it's like, what, what evidence do you have that you are so civilized? You guys die from drinking water because you because you put poison <laughs> in your water intentionally. You're putting lead on their faces for fun. The French were addicted to giving each other syphilis for like 300 years. Yes, this, is, <laughs> this is known. Known facts. Known facts and figures. There's like a TikTok account that I see sometimes where there's like some guy putting on Victorian age makeup and it's like always full of like. He yeah, has always poison. Heavy metals. And like arsenic and like there were liquid mercury drops in your the eyes. The French, the French, because again they were addicted to giving each other syphilis for hundreds of years, would then like mask the uh, physical symptoms of the like STIs that they were giving each other constantly by putting poison on their faces. And then these are the people who decided that they had actually like reached the end point of evolution and everyone else uh, needed to be put in a cage so we could we could gawk at them and figure figure out um, you know what is it what is it like for them to be existing in nature. It's just uh, it's it's fucking infuriating. And yeah. also I think yeah. that the like contemporary fields of anthropology and other sciences like their their roots in these kinds of practices like make themselves known all the time where there is like not a lot of care given to people impacted by studies that are done or like doing studies on people without really like thinking about is this like ethically a thing to do no consideration given for what effect is this going to have on the people that we're trying to learn about? And I bet no one thought to ask the pygmies, like, <laughs> how is it going? Yeah, like, it's just like, no. let's put them on display and find out how they live. Yeah, the the conceit of the people who were putting Otabenga on display is especially heinous, considering, you know, uh, please note before we dive into the story any further that much of the traditionally available information about Otabenga from sources such as Wikipedia, are referencing the commercially published account of his captor's grandson, Phillips Werner Bradford. Wrote a whole book to defend his granddaddy. Wrote a Ugh. whole book to defend his grandpa and all the hell. Could not shit be me. Did. I would change my last name. Yeah. Given the following statements we are going to hear from this incredibly reliable source, Phillips Werner Bradford, we have decided to instead pull most of our basis for Odebanga's story from The Spectacle by Pamela Newkirk instead. <clears throat> Quote, Benga loved entertaining the crowds, singing, dancing, and playing his horn, and wanted to put on skits, claimed Bradford. He also alleged that zoo attendance was greatest on Mondays when Benga's loincloth was laundered and he appeared naked. 
Sadly, he didn't fully understand that people were not laughing with him, but were laughing at him. However, none of this, Benga's delight or his nudity. Moreover, it strains credulity to suggest that Oda Benga and Werner were friends. One with the authority of the state was able to prey on, demean, and traffic in humans for profit. The other was a vulnerable captive belonging to a conquered people. Whatever Werner's feelings towards Benga, the overarching character of their relationship was exploitation, not friendship. In accounts of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and in one he wrote for Harper's Weekly, Werner claimed that he found Benga being held captive by the Bashili tribe, who had killed his wife and children during a raid on their village. He identified Benga as a member of either the... Churchiri or Body Tribe. In those accounts, Werner claimed that he purchased Benga from the Bashili for a pound of salt and a bolt of cloth. In the Zoological Society, Bullets and Hornaday recounted that version of events without a hint of judgment or surprise. He also recited Werner's claim that Benga was mercifully spared, being devoured by the cannibalistic Bashili tribe. Whether Werner actually believed that the Bashili were cannibals or simply sought to lend an air of grace to Benga's circumstances is not known. However, there's no mention of cannibalism in a letter Werner had written after he first encountered Benga. I'd also want to say, just a reminder, we said it once, I'll say it again. Werner bought Oda Benga, purchased him, and, money. and I think six other people from the region. Um, so, like, this, uh, his grandson then comes in to publish a book trying to, like, claim this friendship. This is, like, a joint, like, venture. Like, like yeah. Oda Benga's been brought in on this? It's... Yeah, the humiliation of, like, continuing to perpetuate the idea that Oda Benga was, like, enjoying his time in there and was just sort of, like, clueless of the connotations of people mocking yeah. him. he wanted to put on uh, skits. He loved entertaining the crowds. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, he, he very much did mm. not enjoy any of this, as will become immediately obvious by actual accounts. Sadly, he didn't really understand that people were laughing at him and not laughing with him. Well, why didn't his fucking partner tell him that people were laughing at him if that's what they were? It, it like Also, like this happened decades after slavery allegedly was like abolished in the Western world. Yes, this in happened in 1905, yeah. And I think that this also, like... I mean, it's a it's a good um, hmm, foreshadowing, I suppose, for what happened a couple decades later in Germany, um, where if like people aren't considered humans, then you can do things to them that you have already decided is like unacceptable to do to do to human beings because there is no reason why it should have been okay if slavery was already illegal, like literally in the entire Western world by by this time for someone to be allowed to purchase a person and put them on display for scientific and, like, entertainment observation. Mm -hmm. And I will say, despite the name, Werner is American. Werner is not only American, he is resting. His body is buried in North Carolina. Really? I actually didn't yep. know that last part. Can we do something about that? So this exhibit, Oda Benga at the Bronx Zoo was supported by Madison Grant, secretary of the New York Zoological Society. He had lobbied to put Oda Benga on display alongside apes at the Bronx Zoo. The most notable display was Oda Benga being placed in the same enclosure as the orangutan Dohong, a supposed genius ape who had been taught tricks and to imitate human behavior. This was thought to be, like, a commentary or lampoon. There's a lot of insane news article clippings from this time. The 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 placing of Oda Benga in the same enclosure as Dohong was thought to be, like, a commentary and a lampooning of Darwinism. Hmm. A decade later, Grant would become a prominent, Madison Grant, that is, would become a prominent racial anthropologist and eugenicist. Uh, a bewildered Benga occasionally sat silently on a stool, staring at times, glaring through the bars as his tormentors hysterically howled their approval. To enhance the primitive image they wished to portray of Benga, he was given a functional bow and arrow to shoot at targets in his exhibit. Benga occasionally mimicked the menacing mob, but once a boy goaded him to shoot his arrow, commanding, Shoot! 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 Benga mocked back. The crowd roared. In fact, Benga found that, like the monkeys, he was a source of amusement when he sat motionless, erupted in anger, or sought to relieve his anxiety by playing with Dohong or shooting his bow and arrow. But not everyone was amused by Benga's misfortune. 
Right. The Reverend Dr. Robert Stuart MacArthur, the influential anti-racist pastor of Manhattan's Calvary Baptist Church on West 57th Street, stood among the crowd of hecklers and was outraged. He is quoted here as stating, The person responsible for this exhibition degrades himself as much as he does the African. Instead of making a beast of this little fellow, we should be putting him in school for the development of such powers as God gave him. Now, uh, just quick interjection. He calls him little fellow here, not necessarily as like a way to demean or diminish him, but because Otabanga, as well as uh, many other Africans considered pygmies, were noted for their small stature. Otabanga in particular was four foot ten. Again, we talked about this in the first episode, I believe, but this does not make them a different kind of human. It just means that they are They're shorter short. on average. It's it's so sad that, like, I mean, I guess I don't want to say that they don't exist anymore, but there really was such a strong tradition of um, Christians, like, especially yeah. mm -hmm. in the United States, who were, like, cool. I mean, famously, yeah, like, like, John John Brown was, was like, mm -hmm. very Christian. Um, mm -hmm. and used their belief that, like, everyone was created in God's image as the reasoning for why people should be treated with, like, dignity and respect, regardless of mm -hmm. what they look like or where they come from. And I don't know what happened to these people. I mean, obviously, like, cool Christians exist, but, like, in America, like, not that many yeah, of them. Really. And honestly, no. like, if you're a cool Christian, like, great chance that the church that you're going to is still run by some weirdo ones like what happened to the what happened to the churches with the with the preachers who were like cool where'd they go yeah speaking of like these i guess uh nominally like anti-racist and like actually progressive christians uh macarthur would actually contact the city's black clergy to organize a protest against the exhibit the black reverend james h gordon is quoted as stating the following our race, we think, is depressed enough without exhibiting one of us with the apes. We think we are worthy of being considered human beings with souls. However, uh, in defense of the depiction of Benga as a lesser human, an editorial published in the New York Times read, quote, We do not quite understand all the emotion which others are expressing in the matter. It is absurd to make moan over the imagined humiliation and degradation Benga is suffering. The pygmies are very low in the human scale, and the suggestion that Banga should be in school instead of a cage ignores the high probability that school would be a place from which he could draw no advantage whatever. The idea that men are all much alike except as they have had or lacked opportunities for getting an education out of the books is now far out of date. You can always trust the New Dork crimes to yeah. have been on like just the absolute the wrong, side worst, of wrong side of history like at all times every incident if if the new york times was in publication at at the time of an event that you're thinking of go look up what what they were saying there about it and it's always going to be the absolute worst fucking thing and i mean we were talking about this earlier with like science being political but i think this is also why the the like liberal impulse to always defend science is one that people should really examine and try not to participate in because the debate that's happening here is one that is like spiritualism like versus the, the important supposed science pursuit the time. yeah right. of like a scientific endeavor because the like people on the christian side of things in this are talking about like souls um and that is their reasoning for why they don't think that this is correct. And on the other side is like, well, we need to we need to learn information and we need to understand things. And I think that that is like a pitfall often of uh, like a lot of scientific endeavors. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that it's like wrong to try to understand things. But I think the common li like liberal rhetoric is often one that just like defends the pursuit of like knowledge and information without always like considering if it's the best thing to do or if it's being done in a way that is like respectful to the people or the the land that is involved i do i you know but i want to know what happened to the cool christians where'd they go heaven i it's heaven oh. yeah yeah, yeah, okay. That's nice for them. I hope they're having fun. Yeah. 
After the associated controversy and backlash, Banco was allowed to roam the grounds of the zoo. However, as the verbal and physical prodding from the crowds grew in intensity, Banco became more and more indignant. After being subjected to relentless harassment for weeks on end, he used the bow and arrow intended to dehumanize and degrade him to shoot at the visitors who antagonized him. This resulted in his exhibition being brought to an end. Banga was released into the Reverend Gordon's custody in the, in the Howard Colored Orphan Asylum, a church-sponsored orphanage in Brooklyn that Gordon supervised. However, unwelcome press attention and harassment continued. In January 1910, Gordon arranged for Benga's relocation to Lynchburg, Virginia, where he lived with the family of Gregory W. Hayes. For the rest of his life, Benga refused to reunite with Ferner, which I think speaks a little bit to, you know, whether or not that was a not mutual a, not a friendly, partnership. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is no indication that the two ever saw each other again after they parted in Brooklyn on September 30th, 1906. Still, years after Benga's death, Werner continued to insist that they had been friends and boasted about his African adventures with cannibal tribes. In 1929, Werner recalled two years of the most arduous and dangerous journeys among cannibal tribes on rivers infested with giant crocodiles and bordered with forests abounding in gorillas, elephants, leopards, and lions. He is lying to you about what happened there, and he is assuming that you don't know shit, and also that you, like, have the same dehumanizing worldview of the places that he went to that you're just going to believe whatever he had to say. He's like, what? I was, I was hanging out with cannibals in infested rivers. Um, yeah. Anyway, Bango, on the other hand, led a much less glorious and boastful life. In an effort to assimilate Benga into American life, Gordon arranged for Benga's teeth to be capped and bought him American-style clothes. He received tutoring from Lynchburg poet Ann Spencer in order to improve his English and began to attend elementary school at the Baptist Seminary in Lynchburg. Once he felt his English had improved sufficiently, Benga ended his formal education and began working at a Lynchburg tobacco factory where he planned to save his wages and purchase passage on a ship back to Africa. In 1914, when World War I broke out, a return to the Congo became impossible as passenger ship traffic halted and brought an end to his plans. Benga became depressed as his hopes to return home faded, and on March 20th, 1916, at the age of 33, he built a ceremonial fire, chipped off the caps on his teeth, and shot himself in the heart with a borrowed pistol. Benga was buried in an unmarked grave in the black section of the Old City Cemetery, near his benefactor, Gregory Hayes. At some point, the remains of both men went missing, leaving behind only a grave marker that reads Oda Benga, 1883-1916, Congolese and Booty, I am a man, I am a man. Odubenga is, we're talking a lot about him, um, despite it not really being connected to, like, actual happenings in the Congo during his time in America. Um, because, one, it's important for us to remember the, like, like Pamela, Pamela Newkirk titled her book Spectacle for a reason. Spectacle is, like, the selling point of this imperial imagination. If we don't have these gestures at our own grandiosity we can't live comfortably with the crimes that we perpetuate day by day um Odebenga is a a victim of the evil belgian english and french involvement in central africa and you know like always america is just there to pick up the pieces and profit off of it Looping back into the theme that, you know, science is not a political anthropology at its core, at its foundation, was racist, and it was used to justify racism and used to sort of justify this myth-making and this exploitation. Yeah, I think just in the same way that, like, World War I, as an event, was imperialism and its consequences like come home to roost in in Europe and they had to had to deal with that 
I think a lot of what we saw happen in Germany during World War II was really the just the the natural conclusion of what was going to happen when the fields of anthropology like biology like other kinds of scientific exploration was conducted in this way like there was there was kind of no other way for that to resolve besides just in, in, in like an even larger scale horrific treatment of people that were considered subhuman Back in the Congo, the conservation project established by the Albert National Park had resulted in suffering so horrendous that, beyond the obvious impact on human suffering that we've just gone over, by the 1950s, only about 200 mountain gorillas remained alive in the world. The stated purpose of this park, to protect wildlife, to study gorillas, had essentially turned into a massive, big-game hunting grounds and left only 200 mountain gorillas in the entire world. Protected areas were created without the local community's consent, and their management was oriented around enforcement rather than inclusive of local needs. Furthermore, the creation and continuation of the colonial park system confirmed the new land tenure system that had been introduced by the Belgian crown. To elaborate on this, uh, on July 1st, 1885, a land tenure ordinance was passed to confirm that lands acquired on behalf of King Leopold II would be used by the Belgian crown, but that indigenous peoples could keep their property. Uh, however, following successive royal decrees in 1885, 1886, and 1906, agreements with indigenous people were unilaterally ended. Declaring the necessity to register land, then classifying unregistered land as unused land, on August 1st, 1906, unused land was legally declared empty land, thus implying its vacancy. All empty land became property of the Belgian crown. This effectively rendered all indigenous land as property of the Belgian crown in perpetuity. Because of the historical context of the establishment of Albert National Park, later renamed Virunga National Park following Congolese independence, protected areas are often not accepted or respected by local communities as they symbolize the ruling elite to this day. The laws declaring land the property of the Belgian crown continued until the Congo became independent. As the laws came under review, Patrice Lumumba was killed, the Congolese civil revolution came to an end, and, the, and under the pressure of Western governments, namely Belgium and the United States, um, as well as resource extraction industries, the Congolese officials were for all intents and purposes forced to defer to Belgian bureaucrats for legislative purposes. Unsurprisingly, this resulted in previous land ordinance laws remaining completely untouched, though instead of being Belgian colonial property, they were now the government property of the Republic of Congo. Right. So, uh... Right. <laughs> You'll notice here that uh, people actually living in this area do not have a great respect for the national park that was created by, you know, the most terrible people alive. And you'll notice that a lot of modern day anthropologists are still having this debate of why don't people in Africa respect the national parks? Why do they continue to use the lands for farming? Why do they continue to hunt game meat in the grounds? No matter how much funding we give to the park rangers, we still can't seem to police it well enough. Oh and damn! Well, we can't impose our will over the over the land that these Africans live in, no matter how much money we throw at it. And yeah. the people that live there want to do something different with the land that they live on, even though we told them what the right thing to do is, and we paid the park rangers to tell them what the right thing to do is. They're, they're still doing something different. Why does that keep happening? It's crazy that that keeps happening. Why would they right? want to do their own thing? What is there to do? Don't they know that we know best? What is to be done? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> what is to be done? Right, so it's like, there's such a big debate nowadays of like, well, conservation is such a good thing. Why don't African countries want to do conservation with us? Yeah, In why don't these racist silly trope. little Africans in their African countries, why don't they know that we know the right way to take care of the land? And why don't they just do what we tell them? We know, we know the right thing. They clearly don't know the right thing. It is, 
it's it's almost funny but it's not funny because nothing that europeans do is ever funny in a way that makes me want to laugh um that the people who are responsible for the environmental destruction and like the impending climate disaster that we are living in have the gall and the audacity to turn around and be like all right everyone we know we know what we're doing we're gonna take care of the land and we're gonna do a real good job don't do what you were fucking doing you stupid africans do what we say when it's like who is responsible for any yeah. of this shit why do we need to conserve anything it's because all of these people were uh, addicted to killing whales and burning oil for no reason and now they're like oh the consequences of my actions <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also worth noting that for the Congo specifically, the primary, like the carve up of the national park system is not being done by local Africans. Like Shocking. in the Congolese Civil War, oil companies, logging companies, and other sorts of mining companies uh, uh, provided mm -hmm. financial incentives for rebel groups to capture portions of the protected national parks and sell them as logging mining and oil drilling grounds mm. um in fact it's become essentially a part of you know the the congolese government's like official policy to sell off parts of the protected wildlife every once in a while because essentially they just don't understand what material benefit they gain from maintaining biodiversity we'll go into this in another episode trust but there. Many politicians can be quoted pretty much directly as saying, like, how are we expected to care about conserving the wildlife if we are forced by the economic circumstances imposed on us to sell that wildlife to you? And it's like, you're the ones asking for the wildlife in the first place, so, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is something that happens also in a lot of countries where the, um, game that is hunted um is like they're animals that are prized by freaks with like they're always like dentists i don't know why they're always dentists, dentists yeah. It's it's always shit. Shit. yeah it's always shit that white south african guys really seem to want to kill mm -hmm. well but they'll be americans you know at like american dentists Oil and they, they go to south africa and they like pay off um someone like often the government um not always in south africa but in other places to to like have the right to hunt and kill a rhino or a lion or some other like you know cool cool animal um and then people get upset and they go why why would the government why would they let them do that and it's like go talk to your fucking dentist and tell <laughs> them to, yeah. to not pay for the privilege to hunt an African. Like, why are you trying to get involved in what a government that you have no say in is doing? And why don't you instead, like, put some pressure on the above ground pool owner in your neighborhood and yeah. tell them to not cash out early on their 401k and fly to Zimbabwe to hunt a lion? Yeah, right. And this ties directly back into Carl Akeley, the founder of so-called teddy bear patriarchy and uh, taxidermy, where just the creation of the science or, I guess, uh, craft of taxidermy was thought to be like a scientific pursuit for the advancement of Western science and um, all the connotations that come with that. So, I don't know. It, it's like the same I mean, instinct, I feel well, like. Well, it's the same bullshit. Because, you know, look at a park like Virunga. Those fucking park rangers are about as well-armed as a platoon of fucking U.S. Marines. Like, the, the, it, it's this ever-increasing fucking arms race between poachers and the, the fucking parks. So, you hand a guy who's living, quite honestly, like, in shit conditions in Virunga National Park, being paid $3 a week by the Congolese government, because that's all they can afford to pay, and say, all right, stop poachers. And a poacher shows up and says, I'll give you $400 right now if you let me walk past you and shoot a gorilla. What, what option do you think that that guy is going to pick the majority of the time to make sure his material conditions that works both are sound? Literally and it works as in a both metaphor. directions. Yeah. 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 
I mean, and I've I've I actually watched one about a game reserve in South Africa a couple weeks ago, where like their biggest issue is is fucking like Americans and Englishmen coming to South Africa. They know where the fucking uh, because it's a lion preserve. They know where the fucking lions are. There's only like fucking ten guys on this fucking reserve. It's two hundred square miles, and they're armed to the fucking teeth. But you can't be everywhere, and. If the Westerners are already flying out there with money to kill a lion, they'll pay you off, too. Yeah, I am South African, not white South African, um, and, like, the exchange rate at the moment, not fantastic. I think one dollar, last time I checked, is, like, 16 South African rand, so the dollar, like, spends pretty far there, and... Also, you're dealing with a group of people who clearly do not have that much respect for, like, the preciousness of life, and who are high on their own supply as probably above-ground pool-owning Americans that think that they are, like, more important um, as, as people and have more of a right to exercise their will than, than people that, like, live there. So if you are someone who, like, has any kind of like jurisdiction over a national park or over um like a wildlife reserve or a safari or se or something and then you are being like approached by some like red-faced american who has has just taken like a couple like probably more um like doses of heartburn medicine than they than they than is safe um and is like offering you money so that they can go shoot a lion like what is you know what's the safest option for you there is yeah. probably just to let them like money aside but and then money is also a factor um and i think that the like conservation issue is really interesting to me too because so much of the focus i mean it, it happens here too um where the like onus of environmental protection is put on individual people and like, right. yeah, you know, don't don't buy a Hummer, like don't buy an NFT or something. But there's only so much that you and I can do to like save our planet. And the the gall to go to like Africa and be like, you people need to do a better job at conservation. It's like, what are they, what are they doing? Like, right. especially when it's an American company that is responsible for for drilling for oil. It's like what. What are they doing on a scale that that even matters when that is is what's also occurring? Yeah, and the worst part about this like debate in the anthropological community is that there's a current that's been sort of overtaking thought in the field that is like so obvious that it's frustrating. And there's a lot of people publishing papers saying According to our studies, we found that ex-poachers actually make great wildlife preserve rangers and navigators. And we found that hiring them to do that instead of poaching actually protects the wildlife and makes them happier. And it's like presented as this groundbreaking, like, we figured it out with our huge brains type thing. And not like just a complete denial of reality that this is what was already happening before you made them have to become poachers. <laughs> yeah, I would really recommend if people don't already know about the Macaw tribe um, and the like controversy with whaling, if people learned about it, because it is pretty related where like the Macaw tribe for like hundreds, maybe thousands of years hunted whales in the United States uh, before the United States was even thought of. Then American settlers started hunting whales like it, uh, like there were going to be no more whales if they, if they didn't kill all of them immediately. Um, and so even though the Macaw tribe like had treaty rights to continue whaling, they voluntarily decided not to exercise those treaty rights because they noticed that the whale population was um, going down. And then in the 1990s, when I think that they realized that the whale population in the Pacific Northwest had like reached safe levels for them to hunt one, they tried to do that. And then there was so much controversy about it because suddenly like American environmentalist uh, groups such as our friends at PETA um, like 
wanted to say that it was it was a problem um and i think that there is just like a, an ongoing desire to like police the the i don't know the rules of environmentalism like late to people who were never the ones that were the issue in the first place right yeah so yeah i think that's a good spot to wrap things up at oh i got one question for you austin oh, yeah <laughs> before before we go if I had the power to press a button and it um, obliterated in the past, present, and future the entire field of anthropology and all of its works and everyone in it, would that would would there be anyone worth saving, or are you okay with that? <laughs> are you worth saving, Austin? Um, you know, uh. I don't know. I there's <laughs> there's good people in the field. Okay. Like my uh-huh. my undergraduate professor in anthropology, she's introduced all of these ideas of like post-colonial anthropology to me. And so there's a there's an undercurrent of like people like realizing that the entire past like 200 years of anthropology have been just unsalvageably bad and that we need to start course correcting right now. So I don't know. I I don't know if the end result was worth it, but it's we're at least coming to an understanding now that we can begin to undo the harm that we've done. So, uh, very hard to say. A lot Some of, of it, at we'll least. We'll save you, you know. and we'll save your undergraduate professor. Yeah. And that's it. Well, we don't have to save Austin. I think this is a good point to sign off. Um, thanks, everyone, for sticking around and listening to episode two of our Congo series. This time was a conversation, a lovely conversation with Virgil from Big Soy Naturals. Yeah, listen to Big Soy Naturals. Yeah. Listen. Listen to I Might Do a Drone Strike and Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Great. They also do serious topics. Big Soy Naturals dot world. That's where you can find links to listen everywhere. Great stuff. And then, all as always, you can find Gorilla Radio Show on Twitter at Gorilla underscore radio underscore underscore radio mm-hmm. we need to change that we're gonna say this every single time we say it but we need to change that yeah and on patreon.com slash gorilla radio show all right well bye y'all <laughs> bye bye